My name is Greg Sockliffe. I work for Red Hat. I should not be here. Uh, this should be presented by my colleague Carol. Uh, unfortunately, Carol can't be here, no fault of her own. Uh, so uh, I'm here to, to take her place. Uh, not that anyone can take Carol's place. She's awesome. But uh, because it's not her fault, we're also not going to give her any annoyance about the typo in the slide title, which I know she's already spotted and is mortified about. Um, but I only have a PDF. so. OK, so, so I'm going to talk to you um, about Ansible Contributor Summits. I'm going to talk about what we've learned over the last couple of years of running them virtually, and the ones before that that were not virtual, and where we think that might be going. We're going to do a little bit of data, a little bit of uh, feedback from our contributors, talk about what, we're, what we've discovered along the way. And um, because I don't know everything that Carol wanted to talk about, I will probably have some free time at the end, so I might put a few of my own thoughts in about how I feel about how things have gone and, and you know, what the world looks like now, right? Uh, so she has said that she doesn't have any answers. Uh, neither do I, sorry. Uh, we have a lot of questions about how we think uh, events are going to be, right? Not just big events like this one, small events, medium events. The, the world has changed, but collaboration really has not. We're still humans. Uh, so we have lots of questions, and if you want to chat about this stuff, please come and find. Come, I will probably be heading off fairly soon, but you can come find me in the Ansible community or on Twitter or wherever, and we can have a conversation. And it will be very, very nice to talk about other people's experiences of, of running um, meetups. So, firstly, what is an Ansible contributor summit? What is Ansible even? Uh, Ansible is a tool for orchestration, uh, for managing server state, for doing infrastructure as code. This has a reasonable following at this point in time. Configuration management has been around for close on at least a decade, I would say. Uh, if that is something that you're not aware of and you want to know more about, docs.ansible.com is the place. We have a pretty large community. At one point, when we were still in a single repo, we were in the top 10 projects on GitHub. Um, so we have thousands of contributors uh, on, on, uh, from an internet perspective. We try and translate that into some contributor summits around the world from time to time. And so we'll have a day of, of hacking and talking and figuring out what things look like and where we want to go, the usual kind of thing that you would do with your contribution community. And so we've been doing this for uh, quite a while. Uh, so this goes uh, right back to 2018. So we did. Uh, we have a, a yearly conference called Ansible Fest, uh, which is uh, much bigger and glossier. But we would always tack on a sort of hack day Contributor Summit Day, uh, along with that, so people you know get another night in the hotel and stick around and do things. And you know this is common model. How many co-located events are there here? It's, it's it's huge, right? So this is exactly what we would do with our Contributor Summits. And then, of course, 2020 happened, and we did have one planned uh, for Gothenburg, uh, but sadly it had to be cancelled. Uh, and then, of course, we went virtual from there on out. And only now are we looking at what to do next month. Uh, when we're in Chicago for the next Ansible Fest. And there will be a Contributor Summit. It will be there on site. But of course, there will be a virtual component to that. Some, so you could represent that like this. Because one of the things that we got out of being able to do things virtually is we could do it faster. We don't need a venue anymore, right? So that helped. We could do things quicker. We could get people from around the world involved. So we tried to go a little faster. We were aiming for four a year. We wanted to do it quarterly, but the way the timing landed, it kept interfering with Christmas, which didn't work so well. <laughs> People don't come, right? So as a result, we kind of uh, scaled it back a bit, and we went for three a year, which we did successfully for both years of the pandemic. And then this year, uh, we only had the one in the spring. Various reasons the summer didn't work out, and now we're going we're gonna to have October, and that's going to be this hybrid thing, right? Again, I don't think we're particularly unusual in having to do this. <laughs> the world had to do this. Uh, but it was an interesting time. Um, so just to give a, give a picture, I mean, we've all been here at the conference all week, so I don't think this is unusual. You know, this is Carol loves taking these like fisheye shots with her fancy camera, and my brain cannot process them. Like the, the, these 360, I can't deal with it. So I'm just going to gloss over that slide entirely before I cry. Uh, but then we had to go to this, right? We went from in person, sitting around desks, Great, lots of chat. We had to move to this Etherpad. Blue Jeans was our original um, tech stack because uh, Red Hat used Blue Jeans internally, so it was very easy for us to just be like, everybody's on Blue Jeans, we'll do that. But it doesn't really matter uh, what web RTC system you use. This was just what we were all doing, right? So this worked reasonably well. 
Well, we did uh, evolve the tech stack. And I'm going to show you some of the feedback uh, from the community as we went through these two years. Uh, and so you can see that we kind of evolved things. So we started uh, with a BlueJeans backend, and we were chatting on IRC. Um, we had to use prime time when Ansible Fest came around. And Fest inevitably brings a bigger audience. And so you get um, beyond the capability of what just a simple Blue Jeans room can handle. Uh, we were getting, uh, I think it was 200 people at least that were technically registered for the Contributor Summit when it was happening at the same time as Fest. So it needs something slightly bigger, but we could, or we could offer prime time for that. We went to Google Meet because that's what the company did. So we weren't using so much Blue Jeans. So Google Meet, fine. The, 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 com the community wasn't happy, right? Because these are not open source tools. We're a strongly open source community. We didn't want to be using proprietary tooling for any part of it if we could possibly avoid it. So we got some feedback on that. And so for the later sessions, uh, towards the end of last year, we started using uh, a matrix uh, approach. So. Um, Matrix is another way of doing chat. For some of you will know, I'm not going to go into that. I could do a whole talk on Matrix. Um, but one of the things it can do is, or one of the clients for Matrix can do a nice job of embedding video. So we would do all the presenters in Jitsi. It's kind of your classic um, prime time or uh, similar system where the speakers are separated from the attendees. right? So that only the speakers are on video. That was being broadcast to YouTube. And then YouTube was being brought back into the chat room so that everyone could watch, and, and the chat was, was in Matrix and IRC because they're bridged. Uh, so that worked really, really nicely, and we were very happy with that. We had some good feedback along the way. So you can see, I'm not going to read every single one of these out. We don't have time, and you'll get bored. Uh, but you can see a few here. Stop using IRC. That one really got me. I'm like, fair enough. Um, the losing face-to-face -face conversation, um, very fair. You know, that was that's something that I think we've all felt doing virtual things is that chat is good and we do chat every day in a lot of our communities. Sometimes you want that face to face conversation and it's hard to do, right? If you get to a certain scale where you can't have everybody on video, then virtual reverts to chat and what are we doing here? Like we do this every day anyway, why is this a special day? You could just call it a hack day, right, and be done with it. So that was fair feedback. But there were other good things. So you can see the mention there of being on a FOSS platform. That was in relation to BlueJeans. That was an early one. Um, multiple chat. One of the things we didn't like about using um, BlueJeans and later Google Meet was, um, and this is true of a lot of platforms, actually, is we didn't like the fact that chat is a secondary consideration on most platforms. It's that it is, lo it is part of the room, and it is lost when you finish the conference. Right? It's gone forever. And that is, that is not fun. And, and if you're not in the conference and you want to catch up later, you can't do that. And that was one of our motivations for trying to use Matrix, because we're using Matrix and IRC for the community day in, day out. So if we can get the conference into Matrix, then the chat is part of the record, right? And you can go back and you can, you can play the YouTube video back and scroll back up in the timeline and sync them back up. And it does work. It's kind of weird, but you can do it. And you can follow along as if you had been live, but you know, you're two days later or whatever. So this was fine. So, well, I mean, there's nothing, there's no, we don't have any tooling that would sync it, but you could work it through, right? You could see what people were commenting on as you were watching the video on YouTube, right? So, sorry for the video there, the lady was saying, you know, is it synced up? No, not, not manually only, but, but, you, but you could do it, right? You could do it. So, we found that, that yeah, we, we, we got some good feedback there. There's more. You can see two out of three. Um, so, someone was very excited when we said we weren't going to be using Google Meet anymore, which made me very happy. Um, the disconnect is real. Trying to keep all the tooling in sync, HackMD or Etherpad or VideoCon chat, etc. Difficult, but you know you can make it better. And um, we did try. We tried embedding things in various ways. Um, we tried to make it very easy to do Q and A through you know, reactions and chat and things like that. Um, but then, you know, not everyone's happy, right? You can't please everybody. So you can see there someone saying there was nobody. Once we moved to this Jitsi plus Matrix approach, now we've only the presenters on the video call. Uh, so where's everybody else? Like, I miss the faces. I want to talk to people. But they're not there, right? They're only in chat. So you can't, you can't please everybody. And that was something that I really struggled with for a while. I mean, I've been in community a long time, but you, you, you genuinely can't please everybody. And this is very true in a situation like this, where it's, it's just what it is. Um, but yeah, it, it worked. It was OK. Uh, some point, somebody really loved it. Um, there, were, there were a lot of little teething issues, and there's a lot of evolution along the way. And we found that 
we didn't document things particularly well, like how to get into the, the, the chat. If you're not used to Matrix, you know, it's, it's a slightly different system. So people, some people struggle with that. Somebody wanted a Slack group, that was never gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> I, like the community just flat out rejected things like Slack and Discord years ago, it was like, and rightly so, I think. My point showing all of this feedback uh, is that you can't make everybody happy. We went through a bunch of different iterations and we started with physical and online together back before the pandemic. Then we had uh, just everybody in a video room and then we tried like BlueJeans Primetime, which is fine, but not, not, not open source. And then we had Matrix and there's always going to be complaints. There's always going to be people who love what you've done anyway. You can't win, but you can try and find something that fits with what you're trying to do in your community, right? And that, I think, is important. It's like, what, what does the majority of people in the community feel comfortable with? It's going to be something that matters a lot to how you run your events. Um, there are some big wins, though, right? I mean, look at the time zones thing. We tried to vary the time zone as we went through the year, and that was nice. It felt nice. It was inclusive. Uh, you know, if you do an on-site thing, not everyone can travel. And even when you do virtual, I saw so many events that were always going to be in a North American time zone. <laughs> and I'm like, stop doing that. Please stop doing that. I live in Europe. Even for me, I was missing half the day because I have young kids that I have to go and put to bed, right? And, and if you're in another time zone, you've got no chance. So being able to vary things, being able to include people that couldn't travel, these were positives that came out of it. There were many positives to a global pandemic, but some inclusive, inclusivity is definitely one of them. And it's something that's very much in my mind today as we start looking for how we do the hybrid thing and getting it right. We did learn a bit about marketing. Um, we do a survey after every one of these contributor summits. That's my job. I'm the data scientist on the team. Um, and we start trying to find out where people are finding out about us. And I started asking, like, I, I tried to put this out to the wider community to, um, to find out so we could ask the people who didn't come. This is one of my, I have a friend who works in events, and it's his absolute biggest bugbear is that when people come, they come once and they never come again, and he can never find out why because they didn't come back. And so I started trying to ask the community, if you didn't come, why not? Did you not know? Was it not the right time zone? Was the formatting not correct? Um, was it tooling you didn't like? What, what was the problem there? So not only do I want to hear from the people who did come, because obviously I want to know what their experience is, right? But I also want to know why the people who didn't come didn't come. Mostly it was either it didn't fit with like their work schedule or they just weren't aware of it, in which case we just need to do better marketing. I need to get the word out more. So we started asking where had you found out? So you can see that mostly Reddit. Turns out we have a big strength on Reddit. We did some affiliate links. This is specific to the Ansible Fest events because, uh, oh no, no, I take it back. We did do Eventbrite for, for all of the contributor summits initially because to get that um, blue jeans link out, we had some safeguarding to think about. We had, in the, at the start of the pandemic, you may remember there was a lot of uh, talk about people joining calls that were nothing to do with them and doing not safe for work things on camera. And it was, it was terrible, right? So we were careful about where we broadcast the links. Um, and so you had to sign up by Eventbrite, and then you got the BlueJeans link, and you could come, and you can join the chat. When we moved to the Matrix and Jitsi approach, of course, the, only the presenters are on video, so you don't need to do that. You can just say, hey, anyone can turn up, come join the channel, right? So that's fine. But, you know, we did, we did pretty well. Again, you can see Reddit reasonably well represented. Twitter did apparently super well until you look at how many people actually got tickets from it. But, yeah, I'm not going to talk about Twitter. I have a love-hate relationship with Twitter. So, so the point is here, we had to evolve, we had to figure out our marketing, we had to work out where we were going to advertise, where is the community looking? This was the last, uh, for those of you who were here for the last talk in here, uh, Nicole was talking about, you know, where is your audience? So we had to learn this lesson really hard. Uh, where is your audience? Where are people looking? If you don't, otherwise you get no attendance, which is, you know, not what you want. So I said I asked about how people found it. Um, we... Do a, so we do the survey, and I ask a whole bunch of questions. Uh, so I did do a sort of net promoter type thing where you ask people, um, would they would they say other people should come and do it? And most people say yes, which I was very happy about. The the bottom one I'm super happy about since I was doing the tech stack. I was like, how does this compare to like other vir particularly virtual meetups that you're going to, given we're all in a pandemic? People said it was great. Nearly everybody. Nobody said it was worse than any other event they've been to. So that's that's pretty good. Um, we asked. So that was that was in July, um, which was fine. We got you know 
reason. So, um, so you can see the color. I apologize to anyone who's not got great color sight because I learn to do better colors as I get better at data. These are old graphs. Um, but uh, the big bar there is in the center of that bottom one is, is people who gave it a four out of five, right? So I'm very happy with that. Um, but we got a much bigger bar on the right there a, a little bit later. So I was getting better at running these. Somebody hated me for doing it, but um, mostly you know, it, was getting, it was getting better and better still. So we definitely evolved through uh, how we were running these things, whether we were doing it well, was the tech stack working for people? These are all questions I asked that I'm, we're not showing here, but, but as, a, as, a, as, a, as a collective, do, do people recommend it? Yes, in general, we apparently we run quite good events. But I think this is important to ask. Right? I think in a lot of cases, we don't always go back and check with people and say, hey, what can we do better? Right? So definitely enjoyed learning that. Oh, I, there's another slide. My goodness, this is what you get for running somebody else's slide deck. Gets better still. <laughs> and still going. There we go. I'm going to stop now. I'm going to stop now. But largely, the, the point here, the consistency here, is that, that we've done a reasonably good job of trying to listen to the community and run a good event. So we learned, I say, we learned a lot about marketing. We learned that we didn't do a great job of repeating the message. Um, there's that old wisdom that when you say something for the thousandth time, there's someone who's only hearing it for the first time. And um, I, I feel like we kind of forgot that a little bit along the way. We tended to put it out once, twice, we're done, right? And that didn't work so well. Um, so we learned, we learned we had to get on with it and really get it out there. We have to put it in different channels. I mean, that's, it seems like obvious wisdom, right? But at the time, we were just so stuck in the trenches of trying to get things done that it's very easy to forget these things. Um, and you need a call to action. Um, this is something we struggle with at the moment for various reasons. Um, and having, having a call to action, having a place to go is, is worth doing. We have our mailing list um, right now. If, you're, if you are an Ansible person and you don't already know about the Bullhorn, please, please do, go, do go and subscribe because it's super cool. And I can do a whole talk on how we generate the Bullhorn because it's community sourced and done through a chat room and there's a bot and it's all good fun. So what do we learn from this? There's nothing, you can't make everybody happy. There is no perfect platform. There isn't something that's going to work, for, no one size fits all approach. This is all common sense, but it's worth saying. We found that the Matrix and Jitsi thing worked very nicely for us. It's a almost fully open source tech stack. The almost is because we broadcast it to YouTube. <laughs> but you can, there are ways to consume YouTube and preserve a certain amount of at least pseudonymity, right? So you can run it to a relay or whatever. If you really, really, really want to, you can deal with it. And being able to sort of take it and put that, and that dealt with all of our hosting requirements, right? It's the, re the recording is done and live the second we hit end stream, right? So it's fine, it's finished. And in the meantime, it can be brought back into the matrix room if you're using the element client, or you can just have chat and a web browser open separately, and it works really nicely. That worked for us, it's not going to work for everybody. Accessibility is huge. The first few ones that we did, we didn't do a good job of advertising to people how to get into the matrix room or where to find it. Um, that was a mistake and it cost us and keeping it simple, keeping it straightforward works really well. Um, balancing contributors. This is where, again, matrix gave us a win. Not everybody is used to IRC. That is an older technology and it is fine and it does its job. But newer people are not used to it. So keep, a, keep an eye on that. If you're trying to attract new contributors to your hack days, you've got to meet them where they are. It's kind of you know, straightforward. And then, yeah, do go and ask people how it was. I, I have been to quite a lot of meetups, and I have been surprised by how few of them have asked me my opinion afterwards. And I know we have a bit of a thing about not intruding on people with an open source, and I get that. And like, people get survey fatigue, and they get they don't they're like, why are you asking me all these questions? It feels very intrusive. I get it, but you can only ask. You'll get a certain percentage you fill it in, but at least you get some feedback on how well it went. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely surprised when I, I don't get that from an event, right? So it's fine. Um, and then where are we going? As I said, um, that this wouldn't take me too long because I don't have all of Carol's notes. So I'm going to quickly wrap this up, and I'm going to give you my view on this. This is what Carol wrote. She thinks that we've learned a lot and that we need to make sure we keep bringing people in, both in person and also the virtual side. And that's fair. That's absolutely fair. I would say, though, I am, I am interested in s the scale of the event. I think that's a relevant factor when we look at this. Um, the thing that I have seen happen over the last few years is that virtual events have cannibalized themselves. 
They, 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 you start out with a, uh, here's my local meetup, I can't go to it in person now, so we'll go virtually, right? Fantastic. But then the, the minute, minute you do that, you think, well, I could go to the one down the road, or I could go to the one in the big city at the other end of the country because it's virtual and it doesn't make any difference. And so now this one has no attendees, and this one's got all the big speakers, right? But then that happens again. Now the one at the city at the end of the country is now going to be consumed by the one that's worldwide. And now I only want to go to this one because they've got all the best speakers. And there the, the road ends because as soon as you get to that scale, you can't have any meaningful conversations with anybody anymore because there's 2,000 attendees and chat is ridiculous. So I feel there's a place for the virtual stuff, and it's kind of in the middle. Like Lower than that, as we move back into a hybrid world, I think the meetups are going to come back, and they don't need to be virtual. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I don't think that will work. If we try and make every single thing hybrid, Oh, sorry, I, I said virtual, I meant hybrid. There will be a place for hybrid, for virtual events, absolutely. But hybrid is an extra layer of effort on the part of the organizers. And if you're just running a, a little meetup in a pub or in somebody's office, it's a big ask to get audio visual people in, to record it, to stream it. I don't know that's necessary for meetups, especially when the potential end consequences is it's just going to be someone's going to go to a different virtual uh, hybrid event anyway. So I think meetups will be back. After that, yes. Hybrid all the way. I do not want to lose that inclusivity. I do not want to lose that diversity that comes from having the voices in the room that couldn't have traveled. I think that's massively important. And I do like that when we have chat running, as I know we have for this talk as well, I hope, this, hope it's going well, um, it's, it's that there are people who are going to have good questions that are not prepared to put their hand up and speak. Right? And that's, that's true in every meeting. And it's no different for our events. Uh, and I want to hear from those people, because they often have really, really good points. Um, so we mustn't, we mustn't, that's, that's Carol's point about second class citizens. We absolutely must make sure that if we are going to do hybrid, and as I said, I don't necessarily think every event needs to be hybrid, but if we do, it has to be done right. And that's going to be, that's going to be interesting. I think the LF are doing a great job this time. I, 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 was, I got to see a little bit more firsthand what was happening in ChaosCon on Monday and how they were running all the, the chat in the back end. I think it's a good model. We're going to try and copy that uh, next month for... Ansible Fest and for the Contributor Summit there. I do think it's going to be very interesting to make that work in, in Matrix, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> it's not something we have to worry too much about, but you know what, we might just do the straight to YouTube thing if everyone's comfortable with it uh, in the room. But that's the thing, isn't it? You've gone from Jitsi where you can ask all the presenters, are they comfortable with this? And that's fine. Now you've got a whole room of people. So what are we streaming here? And where is it streaming to? Got to check, right? So. It's going to be interesting, and then yeah, the bigger events are always going to be hybrid, right? That's just that's been that was even before the pandemic. Like fostem has been doing audio stream, audio visual streams for I want to say like five years now at least. Like they they record everything, and so that's not changing. That's not going away. It's important. I, I feel like that's going to come down the scale a little bit, and then meetups are going to be their own thing again. And that's that's kind of where I see it. So for us, it's definitely going to be a case of doing hybrid because we can and we should. We're a big enough project. And we absolutely need to, to make sure we're including all the people who could be part of it. But you know what? We've got 150 meetups, and that doesn't even come close to covering the globe in a nicely even way. And I don't want to put that burden on them. So um, that, that will be a separate thing entirely. OK, this has not taken me very long to go through, as I did not expect it to. Um, so thank you very much. And I will happily have lots of discussions with people who want to have some. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question, or rather two questions. Mm -hmm. The first question is, all the people that are, you think about people that are reluctant to raise their hand in, uh, when we are in person, mm -hmm. are they more or less inclined to be asked questions when they are virtual? That's a so the question is, uh, if people are uh, feeling uncomfortable with you know, raising their hand and asking a question in person in, in a meeting or, or an event, um, are they more likely to ask a question online? Uh, that's a really good question. It is hard to answer because uh, we come back to the identity problem. Right? Do I know who these people are? And would I recognize them in a meeting versus in chat? Right? If I know their usernames, I can, I can figure it out. Right? Um, my gut feeling is I would say, it depends on the chat room. <laughs> it's a piece of string question, right? Because it's a question of whether you, I think inevitably, asking a question is a function of, do you feel safe? Yeah. And that it doesn't change whether you're in person or in a chat room, right? 
And so it's about the atmosphere. Well, OK, it does change, but it's still there. And it's, it's about whether you feel comfortable, whether you feel like someone's going to make fun of you, how, how welcoming is your community. We try really, really hard to be welcoming and to, to make sure people are aware that we don't consider any question to be a stupid question. Right? And so I do think there's also an element of size as well. Like if you've got like 200 people and the chat is really noisy, some people may hold their fire. Um, but it cuts both ways, because sometimes you're really quiet, you don't want to break the silence, right? So I've seen it go both ways. I really do think it's, it's going to be, everyone's got a different safety level. Um, and I hope we can reach a point where it's, it's OK to ask questions and you feel safe to do so in our community. But I can't guarantee it, right? <laughs> it's, it's difficult. I have seen you know, some platforms do the Q&A separately, right? So it's on a separate system. Um, uh, Blue Jeans Primetime does this, for example, you have a separate tab and you ask your questions and the chat is separate. I don't like that model because I think the questions themselves can spark a lot of conversation in the community and, and you don't see them so much. So the model we went with was uh, to, to, ask, to, to just type away, right, to be part of the conversation. And if a moderator saw an interesting question, they would flag it and we had a particular reaction that could go onto that, that question. And then we had a bot that would collate all of the uh, questions so far. And so that moderators could then read them back out, or the presenters could could see the list of questions. So it worked quite well. You had a second question. Okay, so the question is, if we only have uh, you know, a presenter-only format where only presenters are in the video stream, uh, can we then switch it to a more meetup, uh, everybody-inclusive format? There's no reason why not. You have to, you have to obviously have to architect it correctly. The way we did it was specific to Matrix. Um, so um, the element client can embed a, a, a group call just like you would in, in, in some other uh, chat platforms. Um, but it's its own Jitsi platform, right? So you'd have to get the presenters to leave that call and join the other one in order to do so. So we did it for like a lunch break and things. Right, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, we would have a lunch break. It's, yes, yes. I agree, I completely agree. And this is the thing we've absolutely felt the pain over the last few years, is the interpersonal yeah. thing. And we've definitely seen attendances drop, right, over the course of two years. I mean, I, I, I glossed over the numbers, but um, yeah, we definitely saw things coming down over the, over the first, the first year was great. We had generally 50, 60 people at the Contributor Summit, so we would have 200 people at the one that's attached to Ansible Fest, because they're coming anyway, they're making time in their schedule. Um, and then, you know, by this year, it was down to like 30 people in the Contributor Summit. So, yeah, it was, it was tricky. Yeah. Another thing I think is that these workshops move around in time spans. So we can do not only stuff in North America, and we can uh, yeah. take London time, or we can take yes. Or yes. Time. Yes, absolutely. Time zones, time zones are critical, I think. Um, and that, yeah, if you're going to do it physical, obviously you're bound by the time zone of where you're having the meetup, right? Uh, virtual. So the, the, the thing that we are bound by when it comes to doing a virtual event is simply where our team is based, right? So we are, we are roughly spread between sort of mid-US to mid-Europe. <laughs> and we used to have some colleagues um, over in India, so that made it easier to spread things out, but that's currently not the case. Uh, teams change. Uh, and so, uh, so right now, we're stuck with that kind of time zone. Um, but we have, we have moved it around. We do do some in Europe time zone, some in North American time zone. I would love to get back into that part of the world and do one further around the globe, I think that would be fair. Uh, but it's just difficult to orchestrate when our team isn't in some base there. It's a big ask of people out of their working day. Uh, so yeah, time, time, being able to do inclusivity in general, so time zones, um, travel problems, uh, whether that's budget, whether that's company time, whether that's simply like disability, you can't travel. Um, all of these things are reasons why people won't yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's so many reasons why someone wouldn't travel, and yet they have a valid voice, right? Uh, so yeah, I don't want to lose that. But equally, we clearly can't stay virtual. It's, it's dropping all the time. So we need to find that middle ground. And, and I just, I just, I'm just concerned that we try and make everything hybrid, and I don't know that that will work. Um, I, I think as so long as we have a space for everybody to participate, it's, it's kind of the remote working problem. Right? I've, I've said this in so many places. The success of a remote working program in a company depends on the people still in the office. Uh, because they have to remember that when they've had a conversation in the kitchen with someone, they've got to go and update the rest of the team. 
And that is true here as well. We are going to end up with different types of events in different spaces, and we have to remember to come back together. So I, I think there's going to be a bit more of a boost to asynchronous communication methods, whether that's your forums, your GitHub discussion boards, your mailing lists. I think that's the bit where, that's going to hold it all together. Um, and so that's, you know, that's got my attention at the moment, because we've, we've got to sync it back up. We're going to have different types of events. We've got to sync it back up. So, so the point was, uh, what's what's the balance going to be is it between virtual attendees and in-person attendees at these hybrid events? And I think it's a really good point. And I think, right, as it, even if it's not the same people, just the numbers will be interesting, right? Right. Or are you going to virtual and in-person? Right. So it's interesting at, a, at, a, at an identity level, but I think it's just interesting at an aggregate numbers level as well. Like which one which one dominates? For me, part of this is. Um, going to be about the barriers to entry that we talked about a little earlier. Like, how, like we have a problem right now that we've not made it super easy to register for the contributor summit next month for, in person. Like, it's fine. The virtual bit's fine because like it's just a matrix room, right? But it's not s super easy to register for it because it's attached to a more corporate event, right? And and so we're struggling to get the word out about that. And so I don't know what the in-person versus virtual is going to look like. And even if it's a fair representation, right? So what's it going to look like in the next one we do in March when it will be just a contributor summit not attached to an event? Well, maybe attached to another event. We'll see. Um, but you know, it's it, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see where it lies and possibly is it event size dependent? Like, Do we get a better result at a big event that we're attached to versus just doing a small thing ourselves? I'm not. Going. Yes, so, yes, yes, yeah, you certainly can. Since we are talking about not making the virtual people feel like a second class citizen, you're the only person with a microphone here. So don't make it jump into a conversation. That's true. No, that's true. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the point there was simply um, sorry, yeah. I have forgotten the point because, <laughs> so, <laughs> to, 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 no, no, you're absolutely right though. Thank you for, for reminding me to repeat everything. How keen would people be? Okay, so, so, uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. So, so the point was, the point was that if we make it more difficult for people to register, you get an idea of how keen they are. I, you're not wrong. But I am not in favor of putting more barriers in front of people. <laughs> I would much rather have the participants uh, than to uh, than to simply see uh, how keen people are. The problem I have is um, that there is a lot of open source, even more than there has ever been. And if we make it hard, they will just go somewhere else. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think that's a great strategy. <laughs> You're not wrong, but it's not a great strategy, I would say. So, so the question is about onboarding and, and all the technologies, IRC, et cetera. I, I could do a whole talk on what I think about IRC. <laughs> um, and indeed, I did a similar one. But in general. I so so the point is here is 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 it hard to learn? Is it okay to use old things? Uh, I would say it's about the community again. And my concern with Ansible is that it's a very large project, and there should be a new wave of 
people coming in all the time uh, as more developers come out of the university that, oh, they've just taught themselves, you know, I don't want to be ageist about this, not just young people, right? Anyone can teach themselves coding and then go get involved in a community. So there should be new people coming in, and yet when I do my surveys, the demographics I get for the people coming to the events that they've all been using Ansible for at least four years. And so I'm like, where are the new people, right? And, uh, and I've got to meet them where they are. As a community, as a, as a personal user, I have no issue with anybody wanting to use any particular tool. I used to be a heavy IRC user. It is fine if you are a heavy IRC user. As a community lead, IRC, I would argue, I will go on record, is not fit for purpose for running a community. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And I wrote a lot of essays about it. <laughs> but, um, and, the, and, and you can apply these, these sets of arguments to other tools. And we, we don't have time. Um, but the point is simply meet your community where they are. Right? If you think, and it's a bit of a leap of faith. It's a, it's a, it's a marketing exercise. Right? I, community work is the inter, intersection of marketing and, and engineering. Right? Um, so it's a bit of a leap of faith to, figure, to try and figure out where they are and to go try something and see if you're right. And that is where they are. Because honestly, the biggest problem we have in open source is anonymity. I don't know who my users are, right? I don't have I don't, no idea how many Ansible users there are. It's some, who they are. who they are, where they are, what they do, what age they are, what they're interested in. I have no idea, right? You don't have to tell us anything in order to go and download an open source package. And so unlike most commercial things where they will have subscription data or interesting sign-up data or marketing data, we have none of that. So we do have to take a bit of a leap of faith and say we think this is where people are today, and that's where we should be. And if that's what you're hearing from your group, I'm like, it's fine to have it on a personal level, but if you're running a community, you have to listen. OK. All right. Well, thanks very much, folks. I should just shut this thing down. Thanks, Rick. No, thanks for coming, Juan. I will meet you up with you somewhere along the line again. Um, yeah, at some point. At some point. Some got to go home. <laughs> I've got to rush to meet uh, some of the clients. It's good to see you, man. Our office. Uh, you take care. We'll do. See, see you, you again. Too. See you around. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Hang on one sec.